Thanks for tuning in to the Mission Matters Podcast, where we feature successful, mission-driven leaders committed to creating a positive change in the world. Our mission with this channel is to inspire other leaders by providing industry insights, new ideas, and inspiring stories from the pros. All right. Hello, hello. My name is Paul Fife, host of the show where I talk with leaders heading up mission-focused organizations, always leading from the heart inspiring others, and making a difference in their communities. This episode is also sponsored by Paul Gregory Media, who is a B Corporation. So to find out more about what a B Corporation is or what Paul Gregory Media does, visit paulgregorymedia.com. I have with me here Mike Briggs. Mike has uh, over 30 years experience as a president and CEO of operating and growing three domestic privately held manufacturing businesses. That's kind of a tongue twister, Mike. Um, <laughs> Now, he's moved into the position as president and CEO of a nonprofit agency, annually supporting the needs of 800 clients and families dealing with developmental disabilities and autism. That nonprofit agency is none other than Little Friends. Um, Mike, also, you were recently nominated and selected to be recognized as a Titan 100 in the Chicago chapter. So that's an organization that recognizes the top 100 CEOs and C-level executives and uh and you were not only nominated but selected so congratulations on that well thank you uh, and mike is also a fellow rotarian and um and i don't know how many boards you're serving now up to uh but we can we can get into that as well um mike thanks for coming on appreciate it well the thanks for uh making the opportunity paul I, i'm looking forward to this well i'm happy to promote you and your organization um why don't you just jump right in tell us a little bit about yourself for our listeners well, you you, you kind of gave me a quick quick bio. My uh, my background is um, I actually got into uh, I came out of IBM and uh, got into manufacturing in a in a family business at a relatively young age. And where I thought I was going to learn the business at the age of twenty eight, I found myself responsible for a forty million dollar printing operation and uh, was fortunate enough to work in that and get it to grow. We Grew it to about a hundred million, and then as family businesses go, uh, uh, didn't quite see the you know didn't quite have the same perspective uh, as the minority shareholders, the majority shareholder. So it was time to move on and went to another manufacturing organization, which was a wonderful experience that uh, made furniture for schools and offices in the Chicagoland area, and did that for seventeen years, um, and then moved to another furniture company that was located down in Texas. And uh, when it was all said and done, I had about 30 years of experience running manufacturing businesses and chose to retire at the end of 2015. Um, what I didn't expect was there would be an opportunity to uh, I joined the board of Little Friends. I was asked to join and uh, didn't think that I would ever be involved in it from, a, from a leadership role standpoint besides serving on the board. And in early 2017, was asked to uh, step in and what I thought was going to be a temporary position has turned out to be something that I've been with the organization and in this role now for uh, almost seven years. And uh, quite honestly, it's just been a privilege to be able to do what I get to do. Wow. Seven years. And so I was going to ask you, what got you interested in working with turning, uh, with uh, little friends and, I, and you just kind of said the fact that you were on the board first, right? So how do they, how do they contact you? Like, how do they know about you in terms of, um, so I had some I I, I had um, some good friends that were on the board at the time, okay. and in particular, uh, uh, a, a local person who just recently passed away, Dan Casey, was chairman, mm. and we had known one another through um, other organizations that we've been involved with. And he said, you know, hey, we're looking to add someone to our organization, and would you give consideration to joining the board? I had been on the board previously in the late 90s, or excuse me, the late 80s and early 90s, and then left and went to do something else. And since I was, since I was no longer involved in the, you know, in the, on the for-profit business side, when I was asked, I thought, well, this would be fun. It'd be nice to be able to give back. Um, so that's kind of how it, how it came about. Okay. Well, you, you mentioned some, you were, you're from the corporate environment, right? Mm -hmm. You've been in the corporate environment for 30 some years before you retired. And so I always have the same question for people who has been in corporate and then wanted to, to go into the nonprofit world. Now you didn't kind of make that transition from corporate executive to nonprofit executive. You did a board stint first, mm -hmm. but what I find is most corporate 
executives find that retiring into a nonprofit executive role is like the easy gig, only to learn it's never the case. And I'm <laughs> well, guessing it's the same with you. It, um, it, I, would, I would say that's absolutely true. Um, there are some things that are a little bit different on the nonprofit side related to your source of funding, because, um, you know, there's, depending upon how you reimburse for services provide, if that's what you do, um, that becomes kind of interesting. And it's not as complicated as what might be a strategic project in a big, a big product sale that you might have in a, in the for-profit side. But that aside, everything else is quite honestly, Paul, it's, it's very, very similar. Um, yeah. The only thing that's really different for, that I've learned and, and really truly think that's very applicable is that um, we are a 501c3, which makes us a nonprofit organization. But that's only, that's only tax status in terms of what it is. We're a business. No we, employ, we employ um, 340 full and part-time employees. Um, at one point, we were one of the larger employers in Naperville when we were headquartered in Naperville. Um, we still have a lot of employees in April with the homes that we own there. But the reality is um, we are a business and we have to run as a business uh, in order to ensure that we survive and are here to provide the services for the people we serve and the families that rely upon us to be here. Right. And we'll get into some of those like business challenges later on, because I do have a couple of specific questions I'd like to learn more about. But enough about you, Mike. Let's find okay. out what, what Little Friends does. Tell well, us a little about um, the organization. <laughs> So Little Friends, um, and just I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Little Friends was founded in 1965. And as I said, we have, um, you know, about 340 full and part-time employees. Um, our breadth of services is, is about as broad as it is in the state of Illinois in terms of agencies that deal with um, children and adults dealing with, um, uh, dealing with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities and autism. And we also have a school that deals with adolescents that are challenged by social and emotional issues that we're trying to deal with. So we have that as well. If you think of it um, as little friends as an organization and a corporate umbrella, which is probably the best way to visualize it, underneath the corporate umbrella are six different programs that we have. The first being is a clinic for autism that we provide support for kids um, and adolescents that need therapies as they're dealing with the challenges of autism. We run two different schools that one is the school that's primarily focused on children that um, better than 85% of the children are on the autism spectrum and typically one other challenge that they're dealing with. Um, the other students that are in our school are the social and emotional adolescents in the high school that we've got. We have an adult day program that supports well over 100 individuals uh, every day the, in, in the adults range in age from 22 to 70 plus. And then we have uh, 41 homes now. We just got another home last week um, that uh, provides residential support for adults that we care for. The other two programs that make up the total six, um, we have respite family services where we give uh, parents an opportunity to drop kids off uh, a couple days a week in the evening to be able to take care of life's needs. And we're starting a new initiative to try to help younger adolescents who have some intellectual and, and probably challenges related to autism, try to help them gain the self-confidence and the experiential learning that would give them the opportunity to gain um, employment in a competitive setting. And so we've created this initiative to try to really help these young individuals kind of get over the hump and, and get, into the, get into the work environment. So these are the, the, in essence, the six main programs of the things that we do and, and the total people that we support really kind of spread across those, um, but that bandwidth of work that we provide. Wow. And we mentioned in the intro that you support 800 individuals and their families. Roughly. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it varies, um, it varies year to year, depending upon what we do and how many seminars we have and things like that. But yeah, that's the, that's the the general number that we use and recognizing the work that we provide. Sure. I was going to ask you like, who would your ideal client be? But it sounds like with across the six different services, you, I mean, your age range has got to be what, from what age to what age? Uh, we, we start at age three and we go to an adult end of life. 
And there, there are some oh. adults where we actually are their guardians because their family's no longer there. And, and so when we say end of life, we literally are with them until, un, until they pass. And, um, and we care for them in that process. So literally a, a young age three up through, uh, up through that period of time. So when I ask what is your ideal client or who is your ideal client, it's really everybody on the spectrum. It, um, it absolutely. Um, it, and so, um, in, in the spectrum, I'm assuming you, you're talking about the age range as opposed to the autism spectrum, but we do, we do help, um, everybody across the board and dealing with the autism spectrum is, is a part of those that we serve. Um, in addition to that, um, family support is something that we, we include as a part of what we do just because dealing with these things while we can deal with it here it, it's also something that needs to be taken care of at home and we provide supports for families at home as well which is so important um we were talking i'm, I'm kind of going out of order here so we were talking about um your your team i guess it's called the family care team yeah yeah is so, that the support uh, you speak of well it's it's one of them um, we, we, we also have, we also have staff that whose role is their family coordinators that, that really just provide and coordinate information and provide programmatic support. Our family care team is something that we started a couple of years ago. And, and the reason behind it is that we were getting phone calls and emails and, um, it, it, but, but we weren't getting the best visibility to, um, all of the services that people were asking for. And so we first had, we wanted to to get our arms around what every what did people need and were we providing the right services? Now this is a you know this is a for profit strategy. You, you want to know what the needs are so you can come up with the right solutions. And and we wanted to make sure what we were doing was working. So it's not rocket science in terms of what we were doing. But what became really really interesting as we began to look at it, one of the things that we knew was that. Um, if, if you just put yourself into the shoes of a person who just finds out that they have a child who has needs and, and you just allow yourself to let the emotional aspect of that sink in, how do you feel? You're, you're scared. You're, you're, you're frightened because you don't know. You want to do a lot of research. You want to, but you want to take action right away and you want to know who to call. And we just really felt as though because we've been around for so long and we serve kids that are come from eight different counties. Our school supports um, eight different counties and currently over 50 different school districts that we support. We, we had resources and knowledge as to what was, being, what was going on. And, and it became apparent to us that um, people that were on the other end of the line, whether it was at, at a keyboard or at a, at a phone, needed to speak or, or contact a, a resource that they could have trusted. And, um, and so we, we made it our objective as an organization to be a trusted resource. It didn't mean that they were going to come use our services, but we were going to provide them help and guidance because we felt as though that was one of the things that we had a responsibility to provide to the community. And so we have a family care team whose job is to listen and to find out what those needs are. And if we can't help provide guidance and direction as to where they may want to go based upon the various resources that we're aware of that are available in the state, because we acknowledge we're not, we'd like to believe that we're good and strive to be premier, but we know that there are others that do a good job too. And so if something that's closer to where they live or whatever they need, we just know it's important that if they're on the other end, they want to know that whoever's talking to them is listening and then can provide them guidance and direction that, that they can use and, and benefit from and, and feel like it was something that was time well spent and, and they got something good out of it. Invaluable um, resource there. And it's sometimes good just to know you can talk to somebody who's been through it. So when somebody says, hey, you can get testing done in 15 months, they can ask the question, like, is that normal? Is that sort of an exception? Is that an anomaly? Um, and they're getting some real answers from people who's been through that. And somebody who knows what all the resources are in, in the community in you know all the counties that you serve so it must be an invaluable resource i'm sure you're getting a lot of good feedback on that you know we do thank you um it's um uh, i think it's an, it's interesting to be talking about it because if 
I, I will tell you, I, I, I went to the exercise of saying, well, if we could just help everybody who needed, who needed services with the things that we could do, what would happen to our organization if we were able to um, take all that on? What that would require would mean a lot more people. It would mean a number more homes than what we have for residential services. But Paul, if you were to monetize that value from a revenue standpoint, our organization in, in one year would have grown sixfold as to what it is now. And we're at roughly a $23 million organization in terms of what our budget is. And we'd have been well over $120 million in terms of the size of the business um, as to what we could have become had we been able to have helped everybody who needed supports from us. I was say, it doesn't sound like a bad thing, except nobody could scale that quickly. Well, you not only can't scale that, but I mean, the, it, it speaks to probably the, the biggest challenge that any nonprofit or I think most organizations, if you just look around the world right now, have is finding uh, qualified people, um, attracting, um, developing and retaining qualified people to work in, in the jobs. As, as much as we lever technology and we have levered technology to become more efficient, it's a, it's a requirement for what we do. But yet at the same time, it, we still require the touch that comes with the service. And to do that, you need people. It can't just necessarily all be provided by someone sitting behind a computer screen. It requires somebody on site who's personally with that individual. And those, that's, a warm, that's a warm body. And, and we, we could use additional help. And, and I, I don't think I'm alone. I don't think that we're the no. only organization that that struggles with this, but that without question is our, our biggest challenge. Yeah, that is definitely one of the top challenges I read from a lot of um, industry reports. Um, the, the ability to find good resources um, and the ability to retain them. Is another yeah, well, that's, that's, a, that's been an interesting part, especially the past few years. Um, the transition and the, the data that you see on how long people stay in positions, it's, it's different than maybe when, uh, when I first came into the workforce and, uh, and maybe before when you started your business where you were at, things were going on. It's been a noticeable change just pre pandemic and post pandemic. And I don't think yes. you could say we're post yet, but in this, this year, we just started 2024. Um, the attrition rates gone up. I don't know if I've seen a specific percentage, but I've certainly seen it in uh, our own business. Well, uh, to give you some statistics in terms of in in, yeah. the, in our world, um, the uh, the turnover rate in our field um, is in excess of forty percent. Our turnover rate is half that, and it's still obviously high. Over and, uh, what period of time? A year, over a year to year okay. basis. So we're, we, that that's the kind of churn that creates incredible challenge in in an organization. And um, and while we, we we do much better than than what the reported average is, it's still a challenge. Still stings. Without question, still stings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on on you know we're kind of getting into some some leadership things now, and um, and you know managing a business. I, I'd be curious to if you have some insight because you've done leadership. And then been an executive for thirty years prior to even stepping into this role. So yeah, long time. I'm wondering, like, what what things you've learned in leadership in those previous thirty years that you were able to apply to little friends. It, um, it, it's a great question. It, it and and it's interesting. I don't know. I don't know that there's just one specific answer because um, as as you start to think about um, values, you start to think about culture and what's important. Um, I can tell you a couple things that we did. Um, we looked at the organization and said, in order for us to survive, we have to strive to be the best at what we do. And I, I think that that's really required for any business, no matter what, what it is. And you have, to, you have to walk the talk, which means you have to invest in your people. You have to invest in technology. You have to invest in your facilities. You have to if you're going to strive to be the best, then you have to you have to work to create an environment that's totally encompassing related to that. Um, that was a, it's not that that wasn't something that we didn't want to do, but it hadn't been practiced. And so 
when when we started to do those things and make those investments and and then they turned around and paid off and and enabled us to make more investments um that was that was a big thing so a, a culture of striving to be the best is um, i think is something that's just essential um I, there's some values that that Paul, I just kind of really believe you have to live by, and um, a lot of it deals with the the fact of doing what you say you're going to do, and having integrity and credibility behind um, how you conduct business at every level of what you do, and that every person understands that they're responsible for doing what they say they're going to do. It's amazing what that does as it relates to the elimination of waste in your organization, but it's also um, the efficiencies that that I guess are somewhat tied to the waste, but people when they know that folks are 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 honorable and going to do what they say they're going to do, then they they count on them, and then it's amazing they can spend their time doing other things. Um, one of the one of the things that I learned a lot in, in manufacturing that I really believe became very applicable in our organization was lean processing and getting rid of things that didn't add value, and so. Um, as, as you look at your organization and you look at your processes, we, we had some things where I would ask questions. As I, as I think back when I first joined, I'd say, well, why are we doing that? And what do you do with the information which you get? It's, oh, well, we've just always done it. We really don't do anything. I said, well, then stop. Don't do it anymore. That's a waste of time. You're not getting anything out of that. Oh, that's the and, worst excuse because we've always done it that way. <laughs> well, you know, you hear that and, and it's not like, it's like, you know, someone doesn't say that. And, and I get it. But yet at the same time, I think the, the bigger question is if it's not going to be used and, and, and you're doing something or you're capturing information on something and, and you're not looking at it later and you're not reporting on it and it's not coming back to where it's adding value to the business, then don't do it and stop doing it. And it's really interesting when you begin to, you begin to eliminate the things that are um, non-value added activities, you'd be surprised at, at um, what that does to the the effectiveness of your people, and then, quite honestly, it adds to their job satisfaction because they're no longer doing mundane, mundane, useless things that they themselves probably deep down question, but just didn't want to say anything because it wasn't their role or responsibility to do so. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you don't you don't run an organization for the number of years that you've run it. Uh, seven now, eight. Yeah, so it's finishing seven in the seven. beginning of March. Yeah, so you don't you don't run an organization for seven years and not not go through some challenges and come out on the other side. Anything you can share about some recent challenges? Oh gosh, well, um, you, you know, I would I would say that um, if, if anybody followed the trials and tribulations of little friends and being able to move into new space, um, that obviously was a story all to itself. And so that mm -hmm. was a that was a challenge to overcome, but it's not. That's not everybody's everybody's thing that they have to deal with. I think, as I look at it, big picture, um, you know, getting people to buy into the idea of um, we're going to strive to be the best at what we do and be among the best at what we do, and then building a culture and um, it, and it's incremental gains, Paul. You know, I, it, sometimes you make sometimes you make a quantum leap, but it's just continual improvement and then and believing in continual improvement as you make those steps. And if you just remain um, diligent and um, have good discipline about those commitments and hold yourself accountable to what you're trying to do, um, implementing that makes the organization improve. And, and so, um, it's not again. It's, this isn't rocket science. It's but it's it's a process and it's um, an adherence and a commitment to a way of conducting yourself and way the organization can, can should conduct itself that allows for the improvement to occur. And it's the improvement that enables you to have additional monies to reinvest and and assure your long term survival. Indeed, indeed, managed improvement. In steps for sure. Um, one thing I kind of ask organizations, and and really every board member should hold an organization accountable to this question, and and it is, it's it goes around relevance. What if you went away? What would the impact be to the community? And it kind of answers like why you exist. 
And we talked about you serving 800 yeah. individuals and families. So that alone is a huge impact. But I wonder if you can color in that a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'll try to color this in a, in a couple of ways. Um, so when um, I, get, I get asked about the, the priorities of the organization, um, the priorities of the organization are the people we serve, their families, and then our employees that provide the services and the supports that we provide. Um, if we were to go away, every one of those individual families uh, every one of those individuals, their families, and our people would all be affected. And um, if you think about the fact that we're touching 50-some school districts, every one of those school districts would then have to deal with the problem that we're, we're taking on, that, that would be something that would affect individuals that, that families would have to find other residential support. Um, the, there's, a, there's a path that if we're not around as providers, the state is supposed to take on responsibilities. I mean, those are all directed things. Um, our, our direct care team, if you think of the 1,500 plus families that we speak to annually, where we're providing guidance, that would go away. Um, th the other thing is, well, as a $23 million organization, um, you know, I, 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 I'd like to get us a little bit bigger so that we're too big to fail from that vantage point. Um, I think everybody wants to be in that, in that shoe, so to speak, but, um, we affect it. We affect the community in terms of the services we're provided. It's a, it, it, we're not, we're not small from that vantage point. And so from that standpoint, you know, directly the, the, the people we serve, their families and our employees, but then after that it spreads and it's fairly, I think it's fairly significant. Yeah, very significant community resource. And I'm wondering, it was on the tip of my tongue too. I, I don't want to forget it. Um, I may have to come back to it, Mike. It's, yeah, I'm gonna have to come back to it. Okay. Uh, I hate that when that happens. Um, well, I think you've said it all. Um, we've learned about the six programs that that uh, Little Friends does, um, your leadership style, um, challenges that you've overcome and the fact that um, I'm, tr I'm trying to circle back to it, Mike, with the, the fact that if you went away, a lot of families would be impacted. That's the question. Okay, thank you. Are, in your opinion, and, and it may not be opinion, maybe uh, something that you know, are the families in the communities that you serve, you, you'd mentioned, uh, or maybe you didn't, I know you serve in eight counties. Mm-hmm. Are the resources we have, including yours, serving the needs of our community, or is there still unmet needs? Oh gosh, I, this I know, I know the answer substantially. So if you just if you just use the data that that I shared from the family care team, yeah, that there are people that are looking for services that we couldn't help, and and that it doesn't mean if they if we couldn't help them that they went somewhere else and got them, and so there's. For example, in the state of Illinois, I believe the number is 14,000 adults that are looking for residential support that don't have a place to go. They just don't have a place to go. There are only, we have children's group home. There are only 200 children in the state of Illinois that are getting services in the state. Almost the same number was what I've been told is scattered across in other states. Now, Envision being a parent that had to say, we can't keep our child in our home. It's not safe. They need to live somewhere else. And we provide residential support for that. But imagine that these kids don't have anywhere to go. We, we know of kids that are in hospitals um, that are there just because they don't have a residence to go to. Um, there are adults that are, are at home that are looking for services like what we have, but they can't get into a program because there isn't an opening because they're not taking folks. Um, and we know that schools you know, we're getting over 30, between 36 and 40 referrals per month to come to our school. And, 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 and right now we have just over 120 kids in our school. So if you think about that, our school, and we have capacity for more kids, but we know that the kids aren't, aren't they're looking for outside resources. The sad thing about this big picture is that we're in such a growing there's such a growing need and there's just not enough resources in place to be able to help all the kids and all the adults that really need 
assistance and support. And, and yeah. that's, that's not the answer the, I was hoping for, Mike. <laughs> I know it's not. And I got, I wish, Paul, I wish, I wish the answer was, yep, it's all in place and we'll direct you if we can't do it. And the, the truth is, that's not the way it is. And that's, that's why I know, I, I know the work is so valuable because um, we, we are at least able to help a healthy chunk of folks. I just wish we could help more. Well, great, great ending thought. Um, and Mike, I don't know if you noticed, but, and, and people might notice this as they watch this podcast, but if you watch the actual video, but from the time we started to now, um, it went from 4 p.m. in January th that we're recording this to now, and it went completely dark behind you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. How about that? Now, the good well, thing I've is you have some great lighting on, on you. Yeah. So that's, oh. <laughs> you're, you're popping right now, Mike. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Well, oh, you know, one well. of the bad things about being recorded is uh, a bald guy with glasses and the reflections are always a challenge to deal with. So sorry oh, I don't that. think I've seen any reflections. So I think you're good there. <laughs> uh, well, you know what, Mike, thanks again for being on this podcast. I think we all learned a lot. Um, I know I did. And any parting thoughts for our listeners? You know, it's 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 interesting. Um, I, I'm, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity. Uh, to, to be able to tell the story of little friends, um, I acknowledge I don't do the I don't do the heavy lifting and the hard work that our people do, and boy, they do the love and the compassion and the, and the the support that they provide is unbelievable, and, and I'm so proud to be able to tell their story. But the the truth is is that our folks our folks do a, a lot of heavy lifting. But one of the best things about being able to tell our story is being able to just if someone listens, you may individually may not need resources like ours, but you may know someone who's all of a sudden had a need come into their life where they don't know where to go. And if this jogs a, a thought where you say, oh, you know what, I just saw this and hey, this is, a, this is an organization you can call. They may not be able to do it, but they can help you and they're willing to help you and they'll put the time in to do that. Then, then this has been wonderful, and we've made a difference, which I, I hope is uh, an outcome of what today is about. Well, I think we could all certainly agree that you have made a difference in your organization, um, and it's great about what you said with your team because they're the ones interacting with your clients every day and and giving them the love and the support that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Well, thanks again, Mike. Till next time, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Mission Matters podcast. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.